Howdy strangers, this is Thor. Thank you for tuning in to Valhalla TV. So today's video, I want to cover movies I feel that are criminally overlooked. As in, they're great, they deserve their dues, but they're really underrated. So to start things off, I want to focus on the movie Ravenous, released in 1999, starring Guy Pearce and Robert Carlyle. Now plot-wise, this is a bit of a weird blend of western and horror, which is pretty delicious kind of mix. Anyway, the plot features Pearce's army man after a devastating battle. is traumatized and sort of blacklisted within the military. He's sent to this isolated outskirts of California, where he has to he has a thankless task of just sort of sitting around and freezing his ass off. <laughs> he uh, he meets a whole bunch of sort of kooky characters, uh, all played by great character actors and, and a pretty interesting ensemble. Private Reich, he's our soldier. Ah! I'd steer clear of him. And then Robert Carlyle's character shows up and things get really, really fucking strange and really interesting. And pretty much from the moment that he shows up, the film with this underlying tension that this is extremely unpredictable in the way it swerves and curves around until you're at the end. And pretty, the movie pretty much hasn't let up until the final moments of the film. Now, I'm going to stop describing the plot from that point on because... It's kind of doing the movie. If you have not seen this movie, then it's worth knowing nothing about it. That's really the one of the powers of it. It's just the, the twists and turns, how, how things sort of unravel by the final scene. You would have absolutely zero idea. They end where they end. And that's part of the fun. So I'm going to sort of hold back in describing that. And I really want to focus on what makes this film so badass. Now, it had a very troubled production. Originally, there was a director in place, Milcho Manchevsky who had just come off of a foreign film Oscar win and he was hired for his first Hollywood feature but supposedly he had a lot of tension with uh, Laura Ziskin uh, the head of Fox 2000 at that time and there was constant back and forth micromanaging supposedly it, it's hard to tell who was who there's some been some reports the director was a bit of a diva but then you know those were sort of refuted uh, by a few cast members and of course the director himself to describe that it was actually the studio side that was being the major pain in the ass. Basically, the director and Laura were at loggerheads, and after three weeks of shooting, she showed up with a brand new director to replace them, basically. Um, that director was, you know, director of Home Alone 3. Uh, we go on to do uh, Never Been Kissed, things like that. So, talented a uh, group of, of cast members who had worked with the director and sort of had a, a loyalty to him and they didn't want to be directed by the guy who would go on to make fucking Scooby-Doo. Basically the film was pending, it was stalled because of this weird situation. It kind of was no director. So Fox gave up, they, they knew, you know, the, the, the actors weren't going to back down but they didn't want the original director, that, that was sort of like get anybody else but who and Robert Carlyle came up with the suggestion of getting in Antonio Bird who he'd worked with a few times minor breakthrough movie priest with her and and a pretty decent crime movie called face and she, he brought her in and she Antonio has one week prep a week a week to prep this thing and uh and then she shot what you saw a week it's incredible incredible. No, it's absolutely incredible. She, she had originally read the script before the, uh, the original director had, had attached himself. She had wanted to do it, but she felt she couldn't do it justice. And then, you know, the opportunity came back and she jumped at it. So it's hard, you know, from the final result, there was a lot of changing hands. You know, it's a, I mean, it's not, it's a familiar story, a messy production. And usually those films end up as messes. But in a weird, weird way with this film, it sort of adds to it. There is an underlying tone that's always consistent and there always is sort of, you know, and everything is 
held together by these incredible performances and also a beautiful soundtrack. But style-wise, you know, Antonio and the original director are not distinct enough, you know, for me to be like, okay, that's her, that's him. And three weeks of production is enough to sort of establish a visual style and, and sort of all those sets were built with his, with his supervision. So how much of it was Antonio, how much of it was him? How much of it was Fox and it kind of shows in the movie it has this really unpredictable way to it you know almost every every act in the movie is like a whole different fucking movie frankly um, with the first one being sort of a grounded grim uh, western drama the second one really leans into tense horror territory and then the third one is just all out you know dark comedy really exaggerated you know almost leaning into like an evil dead <laughs> an evil dead sort of territory hey i'll swallow your soul i'll swallow your soul i'll swallow your soul <laughs> swallow this uh you know not that silly but close and that's really what I find fascinating about it. So it's like almost this incredible mess of production actually benefited the movie in a weird way. And that's not to say Antonio Burr doesn't do a fantastic job because things like her work with her with her actors and, and keeping things grounded actually help help a lot of the, the movie sort of stay glued together, not just flying off the rails. Guy Pierce is the lead, and this was a really interesting period for him. I always I always find it weird that, you know, at, at one point Guy Pierce was sort of on the same level as a as a Colin Farrell or a Christian Bale. Handsome movie star looks, but was just like, you know, had, had was different in every single movie. You just sort of disappear into a role, you know, almost like a, a Gary Oldman or something. In a similar way that Christian Bale and, and Colin Farrell were doing at the time. Of course, they now they're big A-list guys. It's not that Guy Pierce isn't working he is and he's done some solid sort of ensemble stuff he's also had some pretty uh, frequent collaborations with strong directors like uh, david Micholt and john hillcote but he's kind of lost that luster of, of being a leading man you know he, he definitely is not on a christian bale level at one point it really at least for me personally it felt like that's where he was going so this movie was made in that period where he was still getting cast as, as lead actors and he's awesome i mean in some ways he's really kind of saddled with uh, the less flashy role uh, he's got to be sort of solemn and, and as the moral compass of the movie but he goes far as well and he basically plays every single spectrum of, of the human emotion he's amazingly counteracted by robert carla who also was really enjoying a period of, of being a really exciting uh leading man uh, in those in those days but you know also made his made his bucks by being this really you know showing up on a movie and just basically stealing the fucking show i don't get it i don't see him around in as many movies i think he's doing oh he's doing tv because he's making the bucks and he's amazing you know it's it's kind of like these two actors are going head to head throughout this film in certain ways you know it's not just like a versus um it's it's a bit of a strange relationship the two share i don't want to give too much away but i mean also carla within each act of the movie he's, he's sort of like a whole different persona it just shows how versatile in the early stages he plays this very sort of fragile broken tragic sort of figure and second act it's like that is flipped around to sort of feral uh feral predator and then the third act you know he's this very slick polished clever clever figure Anyway, I, I, yeah, I, I don't want to give too much away. I kind of am, uh, so I won't focus on that anymore. But just know it's they really have a you know dynamic between each other. And everything sort of the film throws at them. They're totally game and don't sort of stick their noses up at some of the more fun uh, genre aspects of the movie. They actually really embrace it. But then when they need to deliver really uh, chilling monologues, or they're incredible as well. How long are you out there? Without food? Oh. Uh, tough. Help him. Good Lord. Yeah. Good Lord. You should have seen me three months ago. And just to round out the rest of the ensemble, there's pretty much not a weak person within there. 
Jeffrey Jones as well. He's doing his little, you know, always an interesting, fun, uh, warm presence. Jeremy Davis is kind of doing his Jeremy Davis thing, <laughs> just as David Arquette is, but it's actually a good use of them. They're pretty limited actors, but fun in these roles. It, it fits them quite well. And also, you know, if they annoy you, uh, they get taken out very grisly. So there's that. Like I said, a lot of what keep, helps sort of glue this fairly off the rails concept, music is incredible. There's certain pieces in that film, moments in that film that stand with anything that she's done. You know, again, getting um, Nyman and Damon Albarn doing the music as well, I thought was just genius, you know, because to get, she, she got the visuals, she got the performances, she got the music, she got everything. You have Michael Nyman, who was known for Peter Greenaway's go-to composer, but he had also made a splash with the piano. <laughs> got this sort of very baroque a little bit off kilter but a very classical sort of style of composing and then you have damon alburn you know who lead singer of blur creative mind behind gorillas basically on the whole other side of the spectrum and that's what's really interesting about this combination is the mu the music is very off kilter very strange at points right And then it all sort of comes together and it's very powerful. Right. Really elevates the movie and a lot of its scenarios. A lot of scenes which you could imagine were if they were just played straight. You think, ah, oh, okay. You know, some dialogue's happening, but this music makes it into an epic, epic fucking event and really just haunts you for days afterwards. I, I watched it a week ago and the score is still just ringing in my ears as it did with my initial viewing. A really beautiful combination of talents there. And that kind of interestingly gets in to the same way that the movie is itself. How you have sort of Michael Nyman, who's more classical, more grounded, seeped into history as the movie is. It's got a great look. It feels authentic. It feels like they did the research on how that sort of side of, of life works during that period. Or but then you know you have Auburn who's sort of edgy and, and very innovative modern voice. And that's the same in this movie. You have this sort of tongue in cheek approach and in some ways it the, the film never takes itself too seriously, but at the same time when it when it needs you to take it seriously it does. And that re that's really what boils down this film. I, I know it's strange to sort of talk about and because I can't reveal too much. I will say, you know, the one cool thing is it's pretty much one of the mov only movies I've really seen in history that really leans into the mythology around the Wind Wendigo. Wendigo. It's an old Indian myth from the north. Man eats the flesh of another. <laughs> Which is uh, this uh, Native American myth. Of course, the director Larry Fesden has used utilized that a lot to quite good effect in movies like Wendigo or The Last Winter or his writing, him writing the script on the PS4 uh, video game Until Dawn, which some of you might be familiar with. However, I, I really enjoyed how it was done in Ravenous, how it sort of took this new mythology and played up with it. You know, there's a little bit of vampirism or zombies and things like that, but it takes it in a very fresh and original direction. I remember watching and being like, oh, yeah, I haven't really seen that in a horror movie. I haven't really seen them play with those tropes or things like that. I thought that was pretty fascinating to have something that really felt original and fresh. It wasn't just sort of like a spin again on, on vampires or, or whatever. And it's incredibly well made. It's gorgeous. It's well acted. It's well directed. It's tense from start to finish. At the same time, you know, it's, it's not... You have your dramatic moments, but also it has a lot of fun just being a pulpy genre movie at the same time. It's able to have its cake and eat it. It does both of these things very, very well. 
trust me, if you're a horror fan, you'll watch this and you'll really enjoy it. You know, here I am sort of championing this. Of course, this film is not made for everyone, but at the same time, that's actually kind of what's fun about it. If this is sort of, sounds like it'll be your cup of tea, you'll enjoy it, and then do yourself a favor and spread the word to anyone who hasn't seen this, and you know will like it, spread the word, because this film deserves it.